Well, every blessing to you all, and welcome back to another open air video. Not the open air pulpit, but one of my backup locations. It has been very hot over the past two months or so, like late 20s, early 30s. It's been the hottest spring slash summertime for well over a decade. And yet, no matter how hard it gets in the UK, by the grace of God, we have water. Uh, by the grace of God, we have the breeze. And uh, by the grace of God, we are able to go to beautiful spots such as this. But just think about those people in hell. Just think about the lost. Just think about the damned. The Word of God says how there is no peace for the wicked. And once an unsaved person arrives in hell, there's no way out. And that's one of the reasons why the true church, those of us which are born again, take the time to speak to people, take the time to pass out tracks, take the time to produce videos like this particular one. Of course, we can't save anyone. The Holy Ghost is a person who convicts uh, the sinner and transforms the sinner and regenerates the sinner. But by the grace of God, Almighty God allows his children, the true church, uh, to share some of the glory when it comes to leading people to the Lord. Just before I get into today's message, just want to say a couple of things that, by the grace of God, I've been able to finish my project looking at King James. I was able to travel around the country and film and uh, speak about the man, King James, a very interesting man. And the article about King James, God willing, uh, should be online around December time. But the video, around one hour and 25 minutes, should be online within four weeks or so. And I think for those of us which are saved, for those of us which are King James Bible believers, it's going to be a great uh, video to watch. You'll enjoy seeing it. And you'll probably learn some things that you didn't know about King James. But for today, if I may, and it's around 25 degrees Celsius, so leading towards, I think, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. always get confused when it comes to uh, the temperature, but it's mid-20s, so it's getting pretty hot now. I wanted to look at two sections of the Psalms. I'm currently reading the Psalms every night and getting a great blessing. In fact, incidentally, before I get into this message, don't forget to join us every Sunday morning, 11 a.m. UK time. I'm currently working through the Book of Exodus, and as of right now, the month of July, I am working through chapter 12. And it'll probably take me five Sundays to complete Exodus chapter 12. So far, I have accumulated nearly 17 hours of material. And Exodus, if you don't know, will probably take me maybe two years to finish the entire book. So join us Sunday morning, 11 a.m. UK time. But like I say, I'm working my way through Psalms and one of my future projects, maybe later this year, is to record the book of Psalms. And as I work through Psalms, I see many interesting things. Uh, but I saw something interesting a couple of nights ago, which I thought I would attempt to record this morning. Go to Psalm 17, please. Psalm 17 and Psalm 31. Now, King David, we know very well, King David of course, was the youngest of Jesse's sons. King David was the second uh, king of Israel, a good king, not a sinless king. There's no such thing as sinlessness outside of the Saviour. But King David is the sort of guy that most of us can relate to. And for the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is someone that we can all relate to. Psalm 17, Psalm 17, look at verse uh, 1. Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer that goeth out of feigned lips. So David, like Paul, was an emotional man. David, like Paul, loved the Lord. And David, like Paul, had two natures. And yet, strictly speaking, the term two natures is a New Testament doctrine. Like when Jesus Christ was revealed to the children of Israel as being the Son of God, that's a New Testament revelation. Yes, there are times in the Old Testament when Almighty God alludes to the fact that he has a son, 
like Psalm 2, like Proverbs 30, but you won't have that explicitly revealed until the Gospels, where the Word of God uh, is revealed to the world. The Word is made flesh and dwells among the world, so on and so forth. Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer, that goeth out, that goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine ears behold the things that are equal. This is a real prayer. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me and shalt find in nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. And most people read this and say one or two things. They say, well, back in the Old Testament, uh, the good and the great were saved by their faith and works. I don't believe that. In fact, I'll say this, that such a belief is heresy. And one of my future messages, Lord willing, will be to look at heresy. The heretic, or heretics in general. The other view says this, that King David knew his nature, he knew his old nature and his new nature, or as we like to say, he knew what was inside of him. And bear with me. Verse 4. Concern the works of men. By the word of thy lips I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. So David, I believe, mirrors the Apostle Paul. And Paul will tell you that he could do all things through Christ which strengthened him. If you are saved, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Something has taken place as a result of you going from knowing of the Lord to knowing him personally. Once you're born again, something tremendous, something tempestuous has taken place. But there's two words to keep in mind, state and standing, state and standing. And I'll discuss that as we go on. A verse five, hold up my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. So don't think for one moment that King David was bragging about being such a wonderful, sinless king. He was far from perfect, but, what, but uh, what I think he is really saying in essence is that as a result of the Lord's anointing, as a result of being priest, prophet, and king, and as a result of being the apple of the Lord's eye, he was rejoicing. He was giving back the praise and glory to the Lord. Because again, I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengtheneth me. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. Doesn't sound like he's bragging to me. Doesn't sound like he's boasting to me. Doesn't sound like he's trusting in his own righteousness which unfortunately a good number of dispensationalists would have you believe. Seven, show thy marvellous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. So obviously he's giving Almighty God the credit. He's not saying, look at me, Lord, I'm just as good as the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not saying that. He's not saying I am just as holy, I am just as right as you are. That's the mistake that most religious people make. We had a situation that took place in Thailand a few days ago. A group of young boys got trapped in a cave and they were screaming and crying, wanting to get out. And the call went out. People were mobilized from around the world, like Britain, America, Australia, and elsewhere. And around a hundred people, a hundred men risked their lives. They went to Thailand, they went into the cave, found the boys, found their 25-year-old uh, teacher, and working closely with the Thai uh, Navy, the SEALs, their special forces, they were able to get all of those boys out. Now just imagine this for one moment, just imagine standing outside the cave, and the cave was like a, like a mile under your feet, imagine shouting to that cave and saying, hey guys, just believe in yourself. You can do it, faith without works is dead. What a fool you would look. 
they can't get out. They are trapped. They need people to go in and get them out. And that's a picture of our salvation. We can't save ourselves. We need the Saviour to swim into the cave, grab us, and get us out. And during that uh, catastrophe, one of the chief Buddhists arrived at this location. The world's media were there, and they all stopped what they were doing. Even the police stopped what they were doing, and the army stopped what they were doing. And they flocked to this man, a so-called holy man. And he spoke to the media, spent a couple of hours with the families, trying to encourage them. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't do anything. And yet, in the eyes of those people, Thailand is a Buddhist country. They thought he was sacred, like the Dalai Lama, who thinks he is deity. And yet, when push came to shove, he couldn't help them out. It fell to the West. It fell to Britain, America, and Australia to lead the vanguard, to lead the rescue mission. And I thought at that time, imagine being a Buddhist, imagine, imagine giving money, tithing, praying, sacrificing to the gods, to Buddha, or looking up to that particular chief Buddhist and thinking what a, uh, what a wonderful man he is, what a holy man he is. When he arrives, things will be done, only to realize that he couldn't do anything. It fell to the West. And by the grace of God, they got all of the boys out. Look at verse 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. From the wicked that oppress me. From my deadly enemies who compass me about. So King David knew his limitations. Yes, he was priest, prophet, and king. Yes, he would rule and reign for the most part in a good and godly manner. And yet... When he got involved with Bathsheba, when the entire incident blew up in his face and he was challenged to his face like Peter, uh, Galatians chapter 2, the wheels came off. It all hit the fan, as they say, and as a result, David had to do some serious praying, some serious repentance. 10. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly speaking about unsaved people, and yet you could say this, you could say he was also speaking about self-righteous Israelites. And we have the same problem today, a lot of self-righteous people in the body of Christ, and they look around and they make uh, judgments as to how people are living. But when it comes to observing what goes on all around us, which is kind of natural, we are visual people, always be mindful of this, that no two people are going to produce the same amount of fruit and also uh, when it comes to the growth the development of different people we all grow at different rates it goes back to that little word yield that simple word yield which gets overlooked like standing in state you have to yield to the holy ghost you had free will to be saved and once you get saved you have free will to either walk with the Lord or not to walk with the Lord and that's what most of this is all about brother such and such doesn't yield as much to the Lord as I do sister such and such doesn't yield as much to the Lord as much as I do and sometimes people turn around and say she can't possibly be saved or he can't possibly be saved I'm sure had you lived back in the Old Testament times and had you been aware as to what was going on with David, and it wasn't just Bathsheba, you know he had many women, don't you? He had many wives, I'm sure you know that. He had many concubines, I'm sure you know that. And had you been around back in the Old Testament, you would have seen what was going on, had you been privy to such information, and you, you may have said this, he can't possibly be the Lord's anointed. He can't possibly be a real Jew. Or for today, he can't possibly be born again, but he was. They have now compassed us with our steps. They have set their eyes, bowing down to the earth, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Lord, take a look at my heart. I'm an upright man. I'm trying to do the best. You have equipped me. I love you. Your enemies are my enemies. Lord, look around, see what is going on. There are many people that say they know you and yet are not walking with you, probably enemies of you, a bit like uh, Elijah who would be lamenting 
and he felt he was the only one in the battle. And the Lord said, by the way, Elijah, I've got 8,000 men who haven't yet bowed the knee to Baal. So you sit tight, old boy. It's not as bad as you think. Look at verse 13. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men which are thy hand, O Lord. From men of the world which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasure. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. I don't get any impression reading this that King David thought he was a cut above other people, like the Pharisees thought they were. I see a man here who knew his limitations, who loved the Lord, was able to say he could do all things through Christ, which strengthened him. Going back to standing in state. Now, standing in state. When you get saved, if you are saved, your standing in the eyes of the Lord is a done deal, which simply means this. If you are saved, all of your past, present, and future sins have been forgiven, washed away by the precious blood of the Lamb. And therefore, when the Lord looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. You have his imputation, which, if you want more about that, go back to Joseph and his colors, his uh, uh, multicolor coat back in the Old Testament. Joseph's uh, multicolor coat back in the Old Testament, if you didn't know, is a type of Christ's righteousness for the New Testament. And therefore, if you are saved, when the Lord looks at you, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness. And when he looked at the Lord Jesus Christ back on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He saw you. He saw all of your past, present and future sins. Now, can your religion offer that kind of a thing? If you are a Buddhist or a Taoist, if you are one of the people that got caught up in the story concerning those boys trapped in that cave, can your religion really offer that kind of a thing? Do you have the perfect peace which passes all understanding? Do you know for sure that all of your sins are forgiven based on what someone has done for you, not on what you do for yourself? But when it comes to your state, when it comes to like day by day, when it comes to like right now, it's a whole different ball game. I'm sure David thought he was going to go to hell. Some of his psalms make your blood turn cold. I'm sure many times people thought when the going got tough that they would lose their salvation and go to hell. Of course, that was never going to happen. Almighty God put the fear of God into such people to cause them to repent. So you see, standing in states are what I think uh, confuses a good number of people. Your state will never match your standing. Your standing will never match your states. If you are saved, and I've been saved 16 years, you won't go probably 24 hours without knowing what a wretch you are and lamenting over your sins. And that's why you were told from 1 John to <coughs> confess your sins. Now it's getting really hot <laughs> and the voice is drying. You are to confess your sins. You are to remain in fellowship with the Lord. If you break bread every Sunday, you are to confess your sins to the Lord before you break bread every Sunday. Otherwise you fall into uh, the condemnation of the Lord and the communion service is simply a picture of what Christ has done for you. 15. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. A picture of the resurrection. Paul told you from the book of uh, Philippians that he hadn't yet reached that level of perfection. He made the case very, very clearly from Romans uh, chapter 7, how the things that he wanted to do, he didn't do, and what he uh, wanted to do, he couldn't do. He was like paralyzed, like a Jekyll and Hyde sort of a thing. Jump over to Psalm 31. Psalm 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. It's all present tense, and here David has gone from Psalm, uh, Psalm 17, rejoicing in his uh, standing, and partly his state, to his ultimate standing, 
in states in the sense of one day he'll be glorified in thee O Lord do I put my trust have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ do you continue to walk with him do you have the perfect peace are you able to do all things through Christ who strengthens you let me never be ashamed over in first John it speaks about being pure because the Lord is pure and if you stop being pure in the sense of you stop walking with him and you become a perpetual backslider then you will arrive at the judgment seats of Christ and not only will you lose all of your crowns but you will be ashamed deliver me in thy righteousness and I'll say this that for the New Testament that would mean to be born again when I see the blood Exodus chapter 12 I will pass over also there are different levels of deliverance you could say to this you could say to the Lord this you could say Lord deliver me from uh, enemies within and without you could say Lord deliver me from uh, myself and also you could say Lord I'm about to drown going back to the Gospels and the Lord reached out and delivered Peter but ultimately we are talking about deliverance from our sins bow down thine ear to me deliver me speedily be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me almighty God is our rock Old Testament, New Testament, and the rock is Jesus Christ, which is a great uh, demonstration that Jesus Christ is deity. It says here, deliver me speedily, because every 24 hours, 50, make that 150,000 people die. That's around 8,000 every hour. And therefore it is uh, absolutely essential to be born again going back to how it came to pass, how it came to pass, and yet in hell, nothing comes to pass. No matter how hot it gets here, I'll be going home shortly and I'll be able to relax and drink some cold water, but those in hell are never able to get out and are never able to have any peace or satisfaction. A verse three, for thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Continue to lead me, Lord. Continue to guide me, Lord. I know that in your eyes I am simply dross. In your eyes I am just flesh and blood. There isn't a just man on the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Look at verse 4. Pour me out of the net that they have laid privately for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. So David is a type of Christ. Much of what David would say would mirror Christ. I'm sure when Abraham was about to offer up Isaac, the Lord tells you from the Gospel of John, how he saw the Lord's soon-to-be death and rejoiced in that day. I'm also convinced that when Moses wrote about the Lamb, Exodus chapter 12, like being a male, like without blemish, like from a year old, take it, kill it, so on and so forth, it may be that Moses also shown a glimpse of the Messiah. But verse 5 is obviously in reference to Christ's death on the cross. Verse 6, I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. So if you are saved, you are different from everyone else. But it goes back to that tiny word again, yield. Do you yield to the Lord? Do you yield every day? If you yield to him, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if you don't yield to him, all sorts of problems are going to come your way, going back to standing in state. Standing is one thing, state is something completely different. Look at the Corinthians, look at Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, verse 7, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversities, and hast not shut me up into the hand of the enemy, thou hast set my feet in a large room. So in the context, it is physical deliverance. Lord help me, I'm about to drown. And the Lord reaches forward, grabs Peter, and rescues him from drowning. Here David is rejoicing in the Lord's deliverance from his enemies. Enemies from within, and enemies from without. Have mercy upon me, verse 9, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. There's no suggestion, there's no insinuation 
that David had it all sorted out, that he was like King Kong, like Levi Brown, like the Don. He knew his limitations. He knew what he could and could not do. Paul would lament time after time that his old nature would hold him back. Oh, wretched man that I am. I have not yet attained to perfection. For my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity and my bones are consumed. That's the Messiah speaking, I'm sure of it. But for David, two natures. Old man, new man. Eleven, I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbours and a fear to mine acquaintance. They that did see me without fled from me. All of the Lord's men departed from him when he wanted them the most, needed them the most. But here, David is speaking, but behind David is Messiah. Antichrist arrives on the earth, they all fall over themselves to greet him, but behind Antichrist is the devil. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I am like a broken vessel, like out of sight, out of mind. And here I'm going to suggest this, that there's a, there's a third way. There's a third way to look at this. David is also speaking about somebody in hell. Out of sight, out of mind. If you've been in hell for 5,000 years, a million years post the great white throne judgment, one billion years post eternity, you are no, you're no longer in existence in a sense. You're still physically burning, but as far as the Lord is concerned, you don't exist. For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Messiah! Not just Absalom, who betrayed David, and Judas would betray Jesus, but in the context, David is speaking prophetically about the Messiah. But for David's point of view, his state. I'm sinking in the mire. Deliver me, O Lord. I'm in trouble, O Lord. I'm just flesh and bones, O Lord. I am made in your image, O Lord. I am made in the triune image, O Lord. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. What would uh, Thomas say, my Lord and my God? My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. So here's a picture of David trying to live a particular way. It could be someone like you and I today who are saved, trying to live a certain way. And those that we know like to gossip about us, those that we know want to see us fall flat on our face, those that we know are praying against us. And you are to rejoice in such a day, and you are to pray for such people. Look at 16. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. It's all about trusting in the Lord's righteousness, his goodness. David isn't going to trust in himself. Let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed, and let them be silent in the grave. In other words, be quiet. Shut your mouth. I am saved. And one day, this will all come good. But for the here and now, it's difficult. For the here and now, we have to wait and see how this is going to play out. Let the lion lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly, and contemptuously against the righteous. Very much a picture of the great white throne judgment. Every mouth will be stopped. And I don't want to think what it's going to be like when the unrighteous are going to be resurrected and see the good and the great, see the Messiah, and have all of their sins played back and just be aghast. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. In other words, keep on going. Keep on living righteously, keep on living godly. Try to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. Speak out against sin, if you can, and make sure you are a living vessel. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So again, on the one hand, it's physical deliverance. Prophetically, it's going to feed into permanent deliverance, permanent peace. 21. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath shown me 
his marvelous kindness in a strong city. You should be able to rejoice. It says over in First Timothy how to always be ready to give a defense of the faith that is within you. And here David is putting his uh, faith and ultimately trust in the Lord. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. He thought he was cut off. He thought he was all through. He thought he was all washed up. But that wasn't the case. He was always a son of the king. He was always the Lord's beloved. If you think of the queen's uncle, before he abdicated back in the late 1930s, early 1940s, I forget the exact date, during the time of uh, Winston Churchill, there was a huge problem in the UK because he was considered to be a Nazi, and he probably was, and he went off with Mrs. Simpson, and to cut a long story short, he abdicated, went from London to Portugal, Portugal to the Bahamas, the Bahamas to France, and towards the end of his life, late 60s, early 70s, contact was made with the Queen as to whether or not he could come back to the UK. He was dying. And she said yes. And he died, I think, in France. And his body was flown back to the UK. And he was buried in Windsor Castle because he was royalty. He never ceased being royalty. He may have been a Nazi, he may have been a playboy, he may have been this, he may have been that, but he was always royalty. And the Queen allowed him to be buried in Windsor Castle, and I think his wife, uh, Mrs. Simpson, is also buried in Windsor Castle, which pictures our salvation, going back to state and standing. If you are a child of God, you will always be a child of God. If you stray from the Lord, like the Queen's uncle did, in a sense, and then come back to the Lord, like the Queen's uncle did, in a sense. She received her uncle. Almighty God will receive you, like back into fellowship. And like I say, he's buried at uh, Windsor Castle. But David thought he was all finished. I'm sure Paul thought at times he was all finished. I know Elijah thought he was all finished. If you go back to 1 Kings, on one occasion he annihilates, was it 450 Baalites? And he's dancing, rejoicing. The Lord is greatly glorified. And then word gets back to Jezebel that Elijah has cut down her priest. She is, she is furious. She is just foaming out of the mouth. And Elijah has a meltdown. And he says, Lord, just kill me. So on and so forth. Again, two natures. Old man, new man. But strictly speaking, old man, new man is, new, is a New Testament doctrine. 23. Oh, love the Lord. All ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Absolutely. That's why you keep on going if you are saved. Your seed lives within you, 1 John chapter 3. Your seed being your new nature. And also that text from 1 John chapter 3 also has some millennial uh, application to it. Your seed cannot sin. And in eternity starting on the new earth or new Jerusalem for the church age, you will never sin because the seed is inside of you. Uh, but for here and now, First John says, if we say we haven't sinned, we'll make him a liar, so on and so forth. So you've got to be careful when it comes to harmonizing First John 1 with First John 3. 24, and I'll close. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Hope in the Lord like on a daily basis forgive us our trespasses lead us not into temptation so on and so forth but ultimately when it comes to our salvation going back to at least three levels of deliverance save me lord i'm about to drown being simon peter king david save me lord absalom is about to throw me off the throne save me lord from myself oh wicked a wretched man that I am. And again, Elijah would say to the Lord, just kill me. I'm all through. Jezebel is trying to hunt me down, or Jonah. Lord, don't waste your time with those filthy pagans, those Ninevites. And the Lord said, listen, I am merciful. I am gracious. I am not willing that any 
should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Psalm 17, David is speaking from the standpoint of his standing in the Lord. He knows that he is saved and he is rejoicing in the fact that he is saved. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And yet at the same time, Psalm 31, deliver me, O Lord, they're out to get me, my enemies are all around me, so on and so forth. Into thy hand, into thine hand, verse 5, I commit my spirit, being the Messiah. Thou hast redeemed me, past tense, O Lord God of truth. So different levels of deliverance, different levels of salvation, temporary, permanently. But when it comes to standing, when it comes to state, when it comes to yielding, that's the key to all of this. The more you yield to the Lord, the more he will grow you, open up your hearts, open up the scriptures, give you the perfect peace to do great things for the Lord. Over in the book of Acts, it says how they had great grace, great grace, which resulted in great boldness, and they would preach the gospel. They were fearless. And it says when Peter and, and uh, John were whipped, Acts 5, they went home rejoicing. And yet today, if somebody gives a Christian a bad look, uh, if somebody uh, cusses, a Christian or tries to shop a Christian, most don't like it, most feel offended, and most behave very badly. So these two passages from the book of Psalms give you a very clear picture of a typical saved man. And David mirrors uh, Paul on so many levels. And we've just looked at two this morning. And if you think you are a cut above the rest, repent. Paul says, take heed, lest you stand, uh, take heed lest you fall. Take heed lest you fall. Uh, don't think you are any better than the next person. You may be more holy than other people. You may have achieved greater things than other people. But when it comes to your standing in the Lord, you are just as saved as that person or that person. Your state, on the other hand, may be a whole different ball game. But when it comes to your salvation, it's all about the Lord. And David rejoiced in the Lord as Paul would rejoice in the Lord. So like I say, I want to call this message the miracle. The miracle that the Lord would save someone like me, would regenerate someone like me, would live inside of someone like me. Father, Son and Spirit, my name is already written in heaven. I'm already ruling in heaven, Ephesians chapter 2, but at the same time, it is down to me because I have free will how I live on this earth. The more I sin, the more I yield to the flesh, the old man, the further I go from the Lord. The more I walk with the Lord, the more I confess my sins to the Lord, the closer I walk, read and pray, the greater peace and power and influence I have for the Lord. So you had free will to be saved. And even after you are saved, you still have free will as to how you live and as to how you uh, go through each and every day. But read these uh, chapters in your own leisure, 17 and 31. And I promise you that if you do, you will see how David uh, experienced life as a saved king, far from perfect. And when the good was good, he was obviously rejoicing. But when the bad became bad, he was obviously buckling, he was struggling, going back to the two natures of the believer. And on that statement, may I sign out and wish you every blessing, peace and joy, in the name of our great God and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen.